Good afternoon, and thank you for being with us. I'm Lynn Weil, Director of External Affairs for the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, at Georgetown University. Today, you'll hear from CSET Distinguished Fellow, Dr. Reginald Brothers, on ways that advanced modeling and simulation methods can help the US government, private industry, and others protect against threats to critical infrastructure and be more resilient when disaster strikes. But before we get to that, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and you experience a technical issue, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and a CSET team member will try to help you out. Don't use the chat for anything else just now. We'll come back to it in a bit after the presentation. And now it's my pleasure to hand the reins over to our moderator. Among his many credit credits, Dr. Richard Danzig is a senior advisor to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and chair of the advisory panel for the Idaho National Laboratories Innovation Center. He previously served as a member of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board and as Undersecretary of the Navy from 1993 to 1997 and Secretary of the Navy from 1998 to January 2001. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Lynn. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you all and delighted to welcome uh, our speaker today, Reggie Brothers. I have to admit, though, to some disappointment as well, when we did a sound check for this discussion, uh, Reggie appeared on the screen with my name in front of him, which offered the prospect of raising my reputation enormously if he went through with this that way. But much to my disappointment, he's appearing as himself, and my skills as a hacker do not enable me to correct this, um, but it is great to have Reggie with us. Reggie uh, is trained as an electrical engineer with a PhD from MIT. Um, skipping the uh, period up to the last decade in his career, which included things like DARPA and time at BAE Systems. Reggie was, uh, when I first encountered him, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research at the Department of Defense, which uh, provided him with responsibility for uh, the nation's laboratory and technology programs. He then uh, went to uh, the Department of Homeland Security, where he was quite distinguished as the Undersecretary for Science and Technology. After leaving the department, he went to work for his old boss at the Chertoff Group, and now is CEO of New Wave Solutions, where he's working on decision support, mostly in the context of military systems and combat-related systems. He's also a distinguished fellow at CSET, and uh, that makes this talk all the more welcome. Well, Reggie, the floor is yours, under any name you choose. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much. Really do appreciate the very, very kind, very kind introduction. Lynn, thank you and, and thank uh, CSET for giving the opportunity to talk to all of you. And, and for those of you on uh, in the Zoom world, thank you for, uh, for being here. So now, let, before you go to the first chart, let me give you how I started thinking about this challenge. Um, as Richard said, I left DOD to go to DHS, the problem for me, Homeland Security. And as part of that role, I had to uh, define the a portfolio of science and technology research, right? What are we going to What are we going to research? What's going to be the most um, impactful uh, for the department, uh, for the government, and for national security, right? So one of the things I did was started looking at charts like this, and I'm sure many of you have seen these kinds of charts, where on one of the axes, and forgive me, I've got to look at, at my screen; it's bigger. Um, for one of the axes, you see the severity of the uh, of the event. So this can go, in this case, from superficial, uh, superficial to catastrophic. And the other axis you can go from it's unlikely to happen to it's very likely to happen. And you see these plots many times in, in, in many ways and they're important because they allow you to say, you know what, these are the kinds of things I wanna deal with because obviously something in the, in the high right hand corner is, is horrible, right? And so, you want, so I was trying to figure out based on these kinds of risk and threat analyses, what should I really look at, right? What should I think about if I wanna prioritize this portfolio that I had oversight of over, over at DHS? So that's kind of what started this, this train of thought that I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through. The next thing I looked at was one of these charts actually. And one of the, one of the ones that, that, I, that I looked at was from the World Economic Forum. And many of you have probably seen this. If you look at the chart on the left, you see a number of different, a number of different icons, right? And the colors uh, just mean in case someone asked, I wrote it down. You've got blue is economic, green is environmental, 
orange is geopolitical, uh, orange, uh, red is societal and, and purple is technologies. And again, you've got impact on the left scale and likelihood on the, on, on the, uh, on the horizontal scale. So you can see certain things, you've got extreme weather, climate action on the upper right, you see uh, deflation, that's in kind of the lower right, but you can also see areas like critical infrastructure failure, for example. Right? Now, one of the things after looking at this, looking at this particular report, and then looking at other reports, what I started to realize was that there's this interconnection. So let's look at the chart on the right. And the reason why I've circled these particular things, extreme weather, infectious disease, and failure of urban plan, you can see those um, circled in red, is because those play particular importance in the three case studies I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And then you can see critical infrastructure failure and in information infrastructure uh, breakdown shown in blue. And if you start following this through, you can see just the interconnections between these risks. And that's one of the challenges I think we have as we look as a nation from national defense and national security. How do we not just think, how do we not just think about individual risks? How do we assess the overall risk threat if these, all these are interconnected? And that, that's what got me started down this path. And I'll, let's take a, a more specific example. Let's look at critical infrastructure itself. The chart on the right, this is showing the electrical system. So in the, in the middle block, that's electricity, right, in, in, in yellow. And then what do you see? You see all of these other systems that are connected to it. So obviously, in order for our grid to work, you've got to have oil and communications and IT and water, et cetera. Without that, it's not going to work. So now, but in themselves, our water system, our communication system, our transportation system, et cetera, these are complex systems as well. So now we end up with a systems of systems challenge. But not only that, if you look at the lower left, you've got this chart shown there. And what does this chart show? This chart shows the three different electric power regions, right? You east, west, and essentially Texas. And you can see, in the, if you can read that, in the lower, lower part of that figure says the circles represents the 66 balancing authorities. So if you're not familiar with this, the balancing authorities are those companies that actually regulate and aggregate the power flows in the distribution system to make sure that you, that you have the right power supply meeting the power demand. So now, not only do you have this system of systems connected, but you also got a 66, for the electric grids case, balancing authorities that have to work to make sure that the power is available. So this isn't just a technology problem. There's a governance problem as well, right? So there's a number of layers of communication that we're talking about here in order to make all of this work. Let's go to the next chart. So let's start thinking about some of these critical infrastructure failures. Now I gotta preface this by saying these kind of failures are unusual, very unusual, but when they do occur, they tend to be called a perfect storm of factors. So we're gonna talk briefly about three particular examples. The first is rolling blackouts um, in California in 2020. The second is an overflow of the Orville Dam in 2017. And the third, while not technically critical infrastructure is defined by DHS, it's a supply chain. And we've heard recently a lot about the supply chain and the concerns about the supply chain. And so I decided I'd, I'd include that in this presentation as well. So let's talk about the rolling blackouts in California. So what, what was the problem here? The problem was that you, we had a, a significant heat wave. In fact, it was called a 35 year heat wave. You hadn't had a heat wave in California like this for 35 years. And what happened was that there are three different agencies that actually uh, work in California to supply the electricity. One is called the California Independent System Operator. Second is called the California Public Utilities Commission. And the third is the California Energy Commission. Why is these important? These are important because the California ISO, they're the balancing authority. They're one of the 56 that I talked about on the previous chart. The California Public Utilities Commission, they have regulatory responsibility and the California Energy Commission, they're the ones that do the forecasts. They do the forecast. So in order for the California ISO to be able to, to know what to, to buy essentially on the market for energy, for that region, for that day, for that time, they have to get the right predictions for the California Energy Commission, and they have to stay within the regulations set by the California Public Utilities Commission 
in terms of how much capacity you have to have at any given time. So you have these three, three governance organizations working on it, right? So now, if you remember the first, one of the first charts I showed, it had risks and interconnected risks. And on the upper right, we had weather. So here's an issue of weather. So the weather was hot. And normally in California, from an energy perspective, the days can be hot, but the evenings are cool. So that gives you some kind of respite. Not only that, California had been working with um, renewable energy, solar and hydroelectric. The problem is it was hot, it was also cloudy. So a lot of the solar, so that a lot of the solar energy resources weren't at capacity either. Another problem was that they tend to have two different measures of capacity. One is called net capacity and one is called peak capacity. The net capacity of the grid is what is, what is meant by everything besides renewables. The peak capacity was actually demanded. And the way the, the forecast went, the forecasting that was done by the energy commission didn't take into account the fact that you wouldn't get as much energy from renewables as you might, as you might normally because of the cloud cover. So what happened was that due to this extreme weather event and the fact there were fires, they ended up having to institute rolling blackouts. Two million people or so were affected in one evening because of this. And the challenge is, how do you predict these kinds of things? So what I'm going to be coming back to over the next couple of minutes is what do we do as we think through these use cases to predict these? So for example, at both DHS and DOD, we do tabletop exercises, right? Where a tabletop exercise, as many are familiar, is where you get senior leadership together to start evaluate, to start going through either a script or unscripted, what happens if you have a natural or um, man-made disaster? What do you do? My question that I'm asking is how do we make sure that these kinds of exercises, these kind of tabletop exercises are done at sufficient fidelity such that senior leadership, decision makers can role play these kinds of scenarios so that when things happen and the op tempo is extremely high, that they make the right decisions. I think that's really what, what this all comes down to. So let's go to the next chart. So this is the Orville Dam. And the Orville Dam, um, as you can see, regulates over a trillion gallons of water. So what was the problem? The problem in February 2017 is that you had rising reservoir levels that are way be, um, uh, gone beyond normal capacity. So then the decision makers had to figure out what do you do about that? There are two spillways. One, you have the primary spillway, and the second is the emergency spillway. So here's what happened. They started um, using the primary spillway. Because of poor maintenance, and we'll get this in a minute, the water went into the cracks. The water going into the cracks caused an upward pressure on the cement slabs, which forced those out. So now you have the cement slabs of the spillway being removed. And then because of poor foundation, which had been understood in previous studies, but never corrected before the, the, the dam was actually built, you had severe erosion taking place, cascading effects, which you see in a lot of these kinds of problems, which then caused uh, catastrophic failure, which you can see in the upper, the upper photograph. So then the um, dam operators in natural panic uh, tried to figure out what to do next. And they had been advised against using the emergency spillway, but they did anyway. Using the emergency spillway, you can see in the lower right what happened. That then had severe erosion and that caused additional flooding. So then what you have is almost 200,000 homes were forced to evacuate. There's another sort of cascading effects. And what did the independent review find? It was a combination of factors, right? Poor foundational conditions, ineffective repairs, and then they used the emergency spillway, like I said before, against the advice of the scientists. A billion dollars repairs. And the, the reason why I put this, uh, the, the picture on the right, isn't so you could try to go through all this, but I wanted to show you the complexity of the decision making that happened here. Uh, you probably can't see it, but in the top right, uh, they start talking about physical factors in pre-1962. And the reason why they bring that up is because in pre-1962, they've done surveys that have shown yeah, the foundation probably wasn't in great shape. And then if you keep following that timeline, you find out that they did repairs that weren't sufficient. And finally, they then have this failure and then they made the wrong decision. And then you have this evacuation order given. At the end of the um, study that was done uh, uh, after, after report, 
quote, shortcomings of the current potential failure mode analysis process in dealing with complex systems must be recognized and addressed. That's what I'm talking about. These failure modes in these complex systems, whether it be a dam, whether it is an electrical system, we have to figure out how to model these things effectively so we can understand from a decision-making perspective what to do when these kind of emergencies actually happen. And the third one is this supply chain and critical infrastructure disruption. All familiar with COVID-19. And I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but the real issue is because people aren't going to work and because the international supply chains are disrupted, there are significant issues with supply chains. And I think what this is going to start driving is different, and we can talk about this, is different ways of thinking about supply chains going forward, right? Are there going to be stress, are we going to have to stress test supply chains? Because if you think about what happened after the banking disaster, we had to stress test the banks. Um, given cyber effects, I was talking to Richard about this earlier, we have CMMC, which is now a requirement uh, in the defense industrial base. Um, stress, um, at least documenting how you'd stress test your systems. Is that true? Is that going to be true with the supply chain as well? And I think we have to start thinking about how do we model not just the, the first order effects, uh, uh, first order dependencies in the supply chain, but second and third order dependencies in supply chain as well, in order to mitigate some of these, these kinds of disruptions. And now here's where I get into what I think we have to do. So th those are some of examples, I think, of challenges. But again, if you think about what I presented, these are single mode challenges, right? It's electricity, it's water, it's a supply chain. This doesn't even go back to the interconnected inter um, electric grid at all, right? It doesn't show the inter it doesn't show challenges that you see with all these interconnections and the interconnected risks and, their and therefore threats. So one of the things I think that's gonna be very important, I'd love to hear some thoughts on this, is an integrated nature of the critical infrastructure systems because it exists, it's situational awareness, right? When you start talking about cyber, for example, what do people say is one of the biggest challenges? They don't know what's in their network. They don't know. And the same problem here is, how do we know what's going on in these interconnected systems of systems? So I think situational awareness is a critical issue. Part of the problem is the critical infrastructure is private, a lot of it's privately owned. So there's gotta be more government industry sharing. Now, when I get into uh, some of the, the, the next charts, one of the challenges in doing the modeling is not having information of high enough fidelity to model critical infrastructure. That clearly uh, requires this government industry information sharing. We've got to be, I would argue, we have to think about the fact that these interconnected systems that are highly complex require security and resiliency. In order to be able to understand that, in order to be able to develop that, it's important in the modeling and simulation domain to be able to tease those effects out. Those effects tend to be nonlinear, right? Because these are nonlinear systems fundamentally. And my concern is nonlinear systems can become, are, can become chaotic and, and display emergent behavior, right? Which simply means small changes in initial conditions can produce radically different outputs. Now, that said, you can argue, you can push back and say, well, you know, there's a lot of checks and balance on these systems. Yes, there is. I'm raising the flag because my concern is, do we know? Well, I know that, you know, people argue that we have checks and balance in each individual system. You probably heard about what's happened to, you know, the cyber incident recently in the water supply. And luckily that was caught by someone that happened to see the cursor moving on his, on his screen, right? We've seen that. But what happens if we have a small change in initial conditions, let's say in the water supply that's meant to actually impact the electrical system, right? It's these kinds of things I'm concerned about. How do we model these kinds of things so that we can game play this up and we can understand how to, mit uh, we can understand how to, to mitigate these effects? So one, one example um, is what um, Idaho National Laboratory has. And why, do, why did I go to Idaho National Laboratory? They're one of the preeminent DOE laboratories that, that, that deals with energy, right? With the grid. They have a significant grid infrastructure. They do significant modeling simulation. And I wanted to understand, frankly, you know, what, what they have, how they think about this problem. So what I'm gonna do is outline how they think about this problem. Uh, and then, we'll actually, then we can actually go, go to a discussion um, after I've made some, some comments. So what is their all hazard frame, framework? AHA is what they call it. 
This was actually meant to do just what we're talking about. Prepare, protect, mitigate, respond. These are the things that we talk about in Homeland Security you have to do in the case of uh, uh, natural and man-made uh, disaster, right? So this is presented in the forms of nodes. So you'll see in, 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 in some of the subsequent charts, you'll see these are nodes that are interconnected. The nodes represent the facilities, whether it's a water facility or an electrical substation or what have you. It has certain parameters that were gleaned either by subject matter experts or from uh, public data. And then the connections, then they, they actually stress, they actually articulate, define the, the uh, dependencies. And then they actually do a risk assessment from that con uh, connected graph model. So there's three types of profiles, and I'll just run through this quickly just uh, because of time considerations. The first is just a, what's called a generic infrastructure profile. So this is a water treatment plant, obviously, on the, the right-hand side, if you look at that chart. And you can see the inputs, you can see the outputs, right? So this is for a generic one. And this is just based, like I said, it could be on public information or subject matter expertise or talking with the, uh, with the actual operator. And then a facility specific profile. So this is for a specific one when you actually are talking to the operator and you've got knowledge of what is, is different about this particular one, how it differs from the, the generic profile. And then you got the dependency models that, that I was getting at. And here you can see where you've got the individual water nodes, if you will, but then you can see how, they, how the inputs and outputs relate to independent ones. So now you've got a graph, right? You've got a graph that has the nodes, which are individual facilities, and then you've got the connections, which show the, the uh, dependencies. From that, as you can imagine, you, you can assign risk. And I'm not gonna go through all this again because of time, but you can see how when you have a connected graph like this, this provides the ability to do a, a risk assessment. But what's the challenge here? The challenge here is that this is a very linear process. It's totally linear process. It does not take into account any of the nonlinear um, issues, the uh, characteristics of these facilities, and it clearly doesn't take into account any of the human factors, right? That's, that's why I'm concerned about having a high enough fidelity simulation regime framework that allows decision makers to game, to role play this all out. There's another model, uh, it's called Deloitte Futurescape. I just wanted to show it in, just look at, um, I don't know, National Laboratory. This is an agent-based platform, same kind of problems. There are a number of platforms. I don't mean to say these are the only two. What I want to get across to you is I'm concerned because I don't see any of these models having the kind of fidelity I think we do need to talk about because the interconnected nature and the nonlinear nature of these systems. So uh, last chart, then we can go to some, some, some conversation. Uh, gaps in the framework and what comes next. So here's the issue. The current modeling does not account for the actual characteristics of critical infrastructure right now. It just doesn't. One reason why it doesn't is, number one, we don't necessarily have all the information because we don't have enough coupling between the um, uh, critical infrastructure operators and some of the folks trying to do this model. Another issue is that it's just plain co computational challenging, right, and time consuming. And it's hard to take these resources, the computational resources, and scale them to these enormous, you know, continental wide. Uh, type facilities. I remember when I was at, at DHS, one of the challenges, we wanted to set up a test test, test infrastructure. And the challenge we ran into was there was nothing domestic that could scale not just the size, but also to the voltage to do that. We actually had to go to Canada to try to find a, a test facility uh, to do some of the tests we wanted to do. There's no stochastic modeling. There's no probabilistic modeling, right? That you might set, you've got a connected graph, and with a connected graph, you might think about markup processes and these kinds of things. There's also no unified approach that details the kind of interactions at the fidelity necessary that we were talking about earlier, right? I mean, how do we want to think about that? So what we saw earlier in the INL, the Idaho National Laboratories framework, was a way to think about these linear relationships, a framework for doing that, a unified approach. What is a unified approach for looking at these more complicated type of interactions? So I'd argue that coming next, there's gotta be much greater coordination and cooperation across the private sector, right? I also add in their test bed operators, because I think in order, it can't just be operators talking to modelers and, and, and people doing simulations, because there's gotta be a way to validate and verify, and verify this in the physical world. And there's a number of people that have test, bed, that have test beds, but there's gotta be some way to have an overarching um, program 
process that tries to capture the full fidelity of these models and the simulations in a, and compare it to actual test beds. So I think we need investment supporting the generation, interpretation, storage, modeling and, and test of these test beds at scale. I think we really have to look at the, uh, the type of failure modes. I think if you look back at the results of the study of the Orville Dam, it clearly said, we don't have the right tools and frameworks for looking at these complex interactions. And then of course, a ver a verification and validation of the model at scale, where we really need to be able to leverage uh, the test bed infrastructure capabilities, as well as the sector, the private sector partners to V and V verify, validate the modeling results. Now, the last thing I'll say is, is you, know, you might ask, what is that picture on the right? Uh, for those of you who really like uh, you know, mathematics, you'll notice that as a phase plane analysis. And I included that in there because what this shows is, is three coupled uh, nonlinear equations. And what the curves show are the trajectories of solutions over time. And the reason why I think that's interesting is because not only is it cool, at least to me anyway, it's cool, but the other thing is it just shows the complexity of, of the math behind this and how difficult it is to actually do this kind of modeling at scale. And so I think we have to really, if we're gonna do this, we really have to think about how do, we, how do we think about this in a way that's scalable and still can deal with this, with this kind of complexity. So thank you for your attention and look forward to a good conversation. So Reggie, thank you so much. Um, it's a really classic example of bringing lucidity to a complex problem. Um, the question, uh, and I want to just talk about it a little bit amongst ourselves. Maybe if you can take down the slides, we can get oh, them. Sorry, sure. Thank you. Um, and then um, we'll invite, I'll remind you, you can use the chat. We're going to invite Lynn Weil in, in a little bit to uh, vo give voice to the audience by uh, articulating some of the questions and comments that are raised in the chat. So you can go right ahead now and begin to compile those on the side if you'd like. Um, what I'd like to do though, Reggie, is ask you, this is uh, the virtues of extraordinary coherence and clarity and ambition. If you will, to me, they're the qualities of the engineer, which, uh, which you are. Um, there's an opposing viewpoint about this. Uh, and I think it's uh, suggested by two books. One, uh, Duncan Watt's book, Everything is Obvious Once You Know the Answer. Uh, and the other was Scott Sagan's book from the early 90s, uh, The Limits of Safety, which articulated a whole point of view that comes from Perot and others. And the point of view in those things is that you can, and it's admirable that you attempt to improve these models uh, and our understanding, but you are doomed to failure. And uh, it is much important uh, aspect of the problem to say, let's accept that we're doomed to failure, that we cannot foresee many things. In the Duncan Watts view, they're only obvious in retrospect. And therefore, what we need to be doing above all is to plan for resilience, uh, accepting that failure. So what do you think about that? So, so I think it's very true. I don't think we'll get anytime soon where we get to a point where we can model all of these interconnections at scale to the kind of fidelity that I'm talking about. I like to uh, you know, set the goal high and, and, and try to get as close as we can. But I think your point about resilience is extremely important. The reason why I think it's important to, um, I think, and we do, right? I'm not saying we don't, we definitely do work for resilience. I think if you talk to grid operators, um, there's a lot more resilience than there used to be in the system. I'm a lot less concerned about some you know, low order hacks and that kind of stuff. So I think that, that's all goodness. My concern is that in order to um, design for resilience, you have to really understand what you're dealing with. So for example, you know, in my background, I used to do cellular systems. So one way to have resilience in cellular communication systems is have multiple antennas, right? And, and so called multiple input, multiple output, and input out, multiple output antennas. And it's important because it allows you to capture the RF signals uh, in a way that, that reduces multipath dependencies, right? Uh, bouncing off buildings, being multipath. Um, but you, you, those antennas are able to be built because we understand the fundamental phenomenology, right? We understand the physics. We have the mathematics to model the propagation of, of RF waves, right? So my concern is, even if, you, even if we accept kind of the, the thesis that you say that we, we won't be able to get to the perfect solution, my response is, 
but we have to at least understand some level of the phenomenology of this complex system of systems ecosystem. Because yeah. otherwise I question how we can effectively design redundancy um, without just building multiple complete systems, right? <laughs> which are total backup systems, which, which is clearly not gonna happen uh, because of financial considerations. You know, I think it's a terrific response. Um, just integrating it, if, if we can, the sort of thesis and antithesis so we get some possible synthesis here. Um, what, I, what I take you to be saying is that uh, the modeling not only serves on the one hand the purposes that you originally presented, but also quite significantly the, uh, it serves the purposes of enabling resilience. But if, if that's the synthesis where we are, then maybe we can use that to reinterpret your three examples. Because in some respects, presented as examples of failures, they're all examples of success as well. Um, that is to say, in the California situation, we managed, the, the managers managed to do what balancing authorities are supposed to do and produce brownouts rather than catastrophic failure. In the Oroville Dam, lots of problems, but the system was well enough understood that you could evacuate all those homes and so forth in advance. And we didn't have extraordinary catastrophe and the like. Um, and, in the, and we had a backup system, however inadequate and costly. Um, and in the context of the COVID, um, I've been fairly involved with some of the COVID strategizing and I would have anticipated in the beginning more extensive failure of our supply chains and the like. I've been surprised at their resilience. Um, so the challenge is one of introducing resilience into our systems using the modeling insights among other things. And actually these cases all illustrate the rewards of that. Is that a fair attempt at synthesis? It's a fair attempt. So, so let, me, let me give you kind of my thoughts on resilience because um, you mentioned I was at DARPA. So one of the things I tried to do at DARPA was, was really start talking about resilient communication systems. Right? And one of the challenges I really ran into, Richard, was I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, was what does that mean, right? What does it mean? <laughs> because we, we say we want to be resilient and we know intuitively that, well, we want to maintain services, but at what level, right? And, so, so if you've got this really complicated system and unfortunately, yeah, I, I'm an engineer, so I think about requirements and maybe there's a better way to think about this. I just don't know what that is, but I, I can say resilience, but how do, I, how do I define a system that is resilient in some sense without really nailing down what I mean by resilience for each one of these individual, individual pieces? Yeah, well, we could move, and this will be my last comment, and we'll, we'll ask Lynn to, to come on, but you may want to respond to it first. Uh, we could take cybersecurity as an example. For many people, for much time, the effort has been, uh, let's build walls and other modes of security that will give us uh, eventually a way of stopping our vulnerability. The resilient approach says, let's accept uh, the substantial degree of vulnerability. Yes, I'll try and reduce it as much as I can. But what I'm going to do is try and monitor the behavior of my system so I know when it begins to move out of phase. You know all this, you know it better than I do. And, uh, but what I'm trying to do in that resilient approach is to avoid certain defined extreme disasters, the equivalent of all those houses under the Oroville Dam uh, being destroyed with their occupants in it. So I'm trying to assure availability, integrity, et cetera. And that's how I define resilience. You get the last word before we open up to the audience. So, so, so Rich, we're, we're on exactly the same space. Um, I am a huge proponent, actually, in one of the charts, talking about resiliency. I think just in my experience, and this is just my own personal experience, I've struggled with designing in resiliency because it's been hard to figure out how to, it's one thing to talk about it, Richard, it's, it's how do we define it so that you can develop a system that actually exhibits that behavior. Now, clearly redundancy is a way to get resiliency, right? If, if it's buried, if it's, not re, if it's not in fact monochronically, it's not the same thing again. Exactly, exactly. So, 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 so that's kind of my concern is, is you can, you, can, you, can have total, you can have redundancy, which would give you a resilient system, but I'm not sure that's the best way forward for all of these, particularly these large scale systems we're talking about. So then I get caught in the trap I've been in before, which is 
how do I really design a resilient, a resilient system of systems without just doing, I mean, you, you could take it heuristically, right? You could just build stuff and see how it works, test it, and then keep going, right? Mm -hmm. I figure, there's, as you know, there's been a lot of uh, push right now in the military towards model-based system engineering, right? Where you're trying to uh, do digital design, do design digitally, and then flow down the requirements as you make changes to make the overall system design a lot more effective and, and cheaper, quite frankly. So I guess I'm kind of coming from that framework of, I'd rather not do all this experimentally. I'd, I'd like to be able to do some of this analytically so that number one, I can do more quickly. You know, we, we don't have, um, a friend of mine, I'm sure you probably know too, she was uh, in DOD, she mentioned that um, it used to be a case you could design a system and you'd have at least 10 years to, to worry about defending it before the adversary came with a counter system, right? As you know, it's no longer the case, right? So my concern is how do we quickly develop these systems? And I think there's, there really needs to be some kind of digital component, digital design component to a modeling simulation component so you can quickly turn designs. But the challenge I've run into, and it may be someone here that, that has a better solution, I certainly hope so, it comes down to how do you specify these systems and how do you then simulate them in, in, in the right fidelity so that you can, you really get the right answer. So for example, you know this, right? I mean, if you really do have an emergent system, you know, this whole butterfly effect thing, right? It's, how, how, do, you, how do you account for that? Unless you can really do some modeling simulation. Am I addressing your, your comment, Richard? Yeah, no, I understand. And uh, I'm tempted to ask you if you really think you and I are in exactly the same place. How come you insisted on appearing under your own name? But we don't <laughs> uh, let's magically summon up Lynn Wilde. So our theory is my is command. That, <laughs> our theory here is that Lynn uh, will serve as kind of a Greek chorus, expressing the interests of the audience um, and asking Reggie some questions directly, Madam. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Thanks everyone who's uh, taken part so far. We're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, first off, going back in time a little bit, in the 1970s, the nuclear power industry moved from defense in depth to probabilistic risk assessment. NASA also adopted some of those tools post-Challenger. Is it possible that the modeling tools exist and just haven't been migrated over to other technical domains? I, 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 would, I would argue that, particularly the probabilistic tools, I, I would argue they, they most likely exist. Um, I think they most likely exist. They probably have not been ported over. One of the challenges is when you use probabilistic domains, uh, probabilistic models, you have to have the PDF, right? Probability density profile, right? Or else you don't really know what's gonna happen. So that means you, this goes back to the conversation Rich and I were just having. If you don't have the PDF, then the results of your probabilistic modeling is probably not gonna be right in a, in, a, in a stochastic sense. So that means we've gotta be able to generate the right kind of models, probabilistic models to do that. So I think the, the frameworks for doing it are definitely there. Um, clearly, you know, NASA and et cetera have done and the nuclear power industry have complex systems and they've managed to, to figure this out. Um, I would love to see those kinds of frameworks apply to uh, these kinds of problems, because I think and it, that's something I think would be very, very helpful. And it's still, however, like I said, it has to capture the right um, uh, uh, random processes, it has to be a model random processes effectively. Thank you. I bet uh, you have another one, sorry, go ahead. Sure. Uh, we also have a, a question from someone based on Capitol Hill with a background in science. It seems to me you'd need to connect together disparate data from multiple sources in order to understand and model such complex systems. Is that true? And if it is, do you foresee issues with accessing and connecting these data? Uh, I see a lot of issues with that. I think it's a great point. Um, one of the challenges is getting, getting folks to agree to share the data. I think this goes back to the um, uh, public-private partnerships that, that I mentioned earlier. It's important, greater cooperation between government and the critical infrastructure providers. Um, one of the things I heard from the folks at INL was that, actually heard from Deloitte as well, um, they weren't getting the, the, the specific information they needed to really do even the modeling at the level they're doing. So I think getting the data is a problem. Another challenge with this um, is if you're aggregating data from a variety of different sources, a lot of times these people don't want other people to see their data. 
right? So then you've got to have some kind of security framework on top of that to make sure that the people giving you the data for them to give you the data feel comfortable doing so, knowing that that information will, will be private. Then the other issue is going to be authenticating that data, right? So you're getting all this data and how, how are you sure the data is right? So, and then, and then not only is it right, but as any real data scientist would tell you, the biggest part of the problem is, is um, 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 conditioning the data. And I'll tell you, that can be up to 75 to 80% of your time is conditioning the data. So now you've got to, you, if you can convince people to give you the data and you can um, convince them with the, with the privacy uh, controls you've got on it, now you've got to make sure you take the time to authenticate the data and condition it in the right way. Because if you're getting from different sources, it may be different formats, et cetera. Sorry for that long-winded uh, answer, but I think it's a great question. And actually, yeah. Reggie, you are channeling the audience yourself in that you answered uh, one of the questions that had come in about dependencies and supply chains and uh, public works and government agencies. So the data collection in the private sector is the nature of the question. So thanks for getting to that before we even had a chance to ask it. Um, <laughs> I just want to chip in myself if I can, that in addition to what you very well described, Reggie, um, there are a little bouquet of other problems. One is that uh, often they don't, the private sector doesn't want the government at all to have the data, um, not just their competitors, because they fear the government as regulators. And that's particularly afflicts the, the power industry that you provided as an example. A second difficulty is that batching all that data makes it a target as a cybersecurity matter. The classic example we saw was the, uh, the Chinese hack of our security system, uh, clearance system. Um, so we essentially collected all the data and put a lot of eggs in one basket. Um, the best protection in some dimension, perhaps for our power grid system is that nobody understands it, including our adversaries. <laughs> but a problem that arises as a difficulty in that context is that our adversaries are very free to rummage through the system unless we have very effective defenses. And we have a variety of constraints of a, regular, of a government regulatory kind. We don't want the government rummaging through the system. Um, and so the result is that in some respects, um, opponents of the system or adversaries can acquire a better vision of how it works, God save us, than we do. Uh, so these just compound the problems you described. But Lynn, you were going on to another question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Quite all right. We, uh... That's what you're here for. It's to uh, contribute to the conversation. And uh, we do have quite a few questions. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can, folks. Um, from private industry, uh, a security officer at a major company, can transparency measures by suppliers contribute to more accurate assessments of resilience preparedness? Try to make sure I understand the question. Transparency measures. Does, do you mean transpa transparency of the supply chain? Is that, is that what you're getting at? Like the second and third order suppliers, is that what that means? I have inferred that that's what it says. Uh, we have just that verbatim question. Okay. And... Uh, so yeah, so for example, one of, the, um, one of the challenges right now, I think um, if you look at um, national security um, organizations is just that visibility. Um, I think, I, and Richard, I'd like, I'd like your thoughts on this because I heard this and it was interesting because I heard that, you know, because of the way the FAR is written and the DFARS is written, um, you don't necessarily get information on third, fourth, fifth order suppliers. So if you're trying to come up with, you know, a risk threat profile or framework to think about your supply chain, um, while you've got all these nice kinds of analytic methods and machine learning, all these kinds of things, you don't necessarily have the data. So I think to answer the question, if I'm understanding the question right, I think it'd be extremely valuable, extremely valuable. But from what I understand, um, a lot of folks don't have that kind of visibility right now and they're not required to, to provide it. I think that's right. And another manifestation of this familiar to this audience is the notion of technical debt. Here are so software providers, first order problem, Nobody really understands somebody else's code. Uh, second order problem, I don't understand my own code when I wind up absorbing a variety of segments from other sources, open source and otherwise. And so we have, for example, large 
constellation of people at Google just trying to please things they're absorbing into their code, which is another manifestation of the same, uh, the same difficulty. Um, um, just before Lynn comes in again, uh, there, there was a question that particularly interested me in the chat. Uh, I have to confess that one of the reasons I wanted to raise it to you is it comes from Dan Gear, and I'm a Dan Gear fan, not that I'm not a, uh, a fan of others who ask these questions, particularly my friends out there. But Dan asks, um, he says, designing for resilience to random faults versus designing for resilience to targeted faults lead to different outcomes. And in a Dan Gear type way, he then says, comment. So Reggie, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, I think that's true. I, I, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, I think that the, my concern is that when we do, if I go back to kind of where I started this one, if I go back to my desire to have decision makers be able to game this out, when we game these things out, um, it's against usually, you know, thought out use cases. It's not just kind of random, random failures. Now, you, so I think, I think it is important. I think that we do think through these normal use cases. I think one of the challenges we have though, um, and actually Rich and I were talking about this before, before we started, there may, you know, if you start getting into some of these machine learning kind of attacks, you may get things that are unconventional, right? They're not necessarily random, but they're unconventional. And I think the, the challenge we have as game masters is not just coming up with what we think would be normal challenges to the system, but also unconventional attacks. And I think that, that's a challenge unto itself. For sure. Lynn? Yes, we have two short questions. So I thought I'd combine them. Uh, roughly what percentage of our modeling challenge is organizational? And are there metrics for stress testing systems? So yes, there, there are definitely metrics for stress testing systems. Um, what percentage is organization? I think it depends on which system. But I think if you look at the examples we talked about, a high, I'm, I can't say exactly what percentage, but a high percentage is organizational, right? Because that's why I brought up that governance piece, because I think um, you can look at, look at what happened at the gap. I mean, you, you end up with communication challenges um, all the time in these organizational structures and, and having various touch points. So I think that's something that, again, when you do these tabletop exercises, that's when you start fleshing those things out. I remember going through one tabletop exercise and it turned out that it was very difficult for one senior leadership at the federal level to communicate with a senior leader at the, leader at the state level, right? And, and that, was, that was determined to be a significant bottleneck, right? And that came out in that tabletop exercise. So I think they're, it's a great question. I think, I think they're significant. And, and I don't mean to imply that just by having a, high fidelity technical model, that's gonna change anything. I think what that does do, and, and love to hear pushback, is that it provides a, a baseline for decision makers to exercise the governance structure on top of that, right? So now at least you've got a baseline of what could happen, whether it's a probabilistic model or determin deterministic model, at least you've got the fidelity so the decision makers understand what are the system constraints and now they have to exercise the governance constraints. And there is an extent to which simply working through the exercise builds the muscles of response so that you improve your ability, um, even when you're not in the end being doing a good job of predicting the particular problems that are going to arise. They're training exercises as well. well let me, so Richard, I'm sorry, I gotta ask a question. Um, Fidelity of these models, I mean, you've been to these exercises, do you see them as, as appropriately unscripted or too scripted? <laughs> what, what have you seen? As a general rule, I think too scripted. Um, there are obviously possibilities for error in both directions, but most of the exercises that I've seen are too anxious to test some subordinate skill and want to stay on track and create a certain illusion about the bounds of the problem so that I definitely want that kind of exercise, um, but I don't, uh, I, I think the system undervalues the potential for uh, disruptive change, disruptive challenges because they're too limited by the minds of the, by the patterns of invention of the people who create the problem. The, uh, the famous example of this is uh, General Van Riper in the Marine Corps. 
um, disrupting an exercise entirely, a military exercise, by introducing a whole lot of asymmetrical activities that resulted in victory so readily for his red forces that they not only rolled back the exercise and did it again, but they threw him out of it because he was producing outcomes that didn't test what they wanted in their view and in his view because they were defending tradition. Uh, and over time, we've come to appreciate the kinds of inputs he provided in that exercise more than we would have valued any other attribute in that exercise. Sure. Lynn, you can squeeze in a couple more. Uh, very good. Um, regarding the Florida water incident that you discussed, what are the concerns as systems or networks become more complex, for example, with use of AI or ML to monitor threats? If a similar event like that incident were to happen again, how much more concerning would it be? And how much more challenging does it make stress testing each IoT software or hardware uh, or AI ML model? Yeah, I, I, so I think it does make it, it, it can make it significantly harder um, to stress test things like this. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk about, you know, verification validation of AI systems um, and how to do that. Um, there are, you know, black box AI, there's white box AI, white box where you can kind of see what's going on, there's traceability through the system, black box AI where, where, where you can't. Um, you talked about, I think, I think when you mentioned IoT, um, when you start throwing, you know, this plethora of, of devices out there, your attack surface, you know, obviously increases exponentially. Um, I, th I think it, it definitely creates a problem. Um, I think one of the challenges even to use um, AI systems, which are machine learning these days, is the data, right? I mean, these are deductive, these are inductive systems, right? And they're just getting, they're just deriving insights from the data itself. And if you don't have the right data, um, you're gonna have some, some serious problems. And then there's gonna be challenges with trying to validate these learning systems across a variety of outcomes to make sure that you, you're not gonna get trapped in some corner case, right? Because if you think about these systems, they're essentially, in, in a very simplistic sense, they're doing, they're doing some type of interpolation across some hyperdimensional space, right? Well, whenever you're doing that kind of optimization, there can always be a local minimum that's not the global minimum, which means you've optimized the wrong point. So you might get an answer, but you might get an answer for all the data points you test, but there could be a pathological data point you didn't test for that could be bad, right? And so the verification validation, it's a long way of saying, yes, I think, I think verification validation is important for these systems. I think that um, when you start introducing ML and learning systems and all of these IoT devices on the edge, um, I think you have, while you, you, you can see some good things coming out of that, I think there could be some very complicated threats and risk associated with it as well. You know, that, that point is compounded by the problem of definition of what you're looking at. Um, I remember as a case in point, uh, some of us worked on uh, the problems of defining critical infrastructure in the first executive order uh, that was issued on the subject. And uh, there were, I can't remember, 12 areas defined. Um, it seemed to me at the time to be a pretty good, pretty comprehensive list. And the first problem that we had to deal with after that was the North Korean attack on Sony. Uh, and this threw everybody for a loop, you will recollect it as well. Uh, but none of us thought, oh, we're defining the critical systems the White House has to be prepared to respond to and it should include a movie theater. Um, it's just too out of the blue. Um, so. We tend all to create our own lampposts and look under those lights and uh, there's a vast area of darkness out there that ingenuity will create. For a long time, a lot of us thought we were worrying about cyber issues that really mattered and overlooked the disinformation possibilities, underinvested in concern with elections and electoral systems, and the examples go on and on. Oh, Lynn, I don't want to go on and on well beyond our time, but I think we can steal maybe five more minutes I'm encouraged by Jamie Dernan's comment in the chat, Reggie, that this is a brilliant presentation. So we ought to stake Reggie to five more minutes if we can. And, and I gotta thank Jamie for that, that comment. <laughs> He's gonna reproduce it and then you'll be stuck for 10 minutes. 
And the question uh, about the presentation regarding the last slide, challenges to improved modeling, uh, which improvements would bring the most immediate advances? And are there situations where progress in modeling should be implemented, perhaps to avoid costs such as those resulting from the Oroville failure? So I think the, um, the biggest boon, whether you get nonlinear models or not with the data, right? The, the biggest boon would be able to fully um, uh, get the full information of these different nodes and facilities into even linear models like what INL has. That would be that would be a huge gain just to get that kind of data. So the the person that asked about um, well, he was talking about he or she was asking about transparency in the supply chain. But the real thing is we need data. This this public private partnership to get data into um, a framework is extremely extremely important. So I think that's that's the that's a major that's a major piece. Um, I think if we could then go to and start understanding um, the interdependencies, if you start if you start understanding, let's say for example, you you're not going to model all of the internals of these systems. That that's that's too complex to do. But if you're able to at least model input and output in a nonlinear fashion and explore, and get that kind of data, that would then be extremely helpful as well because now you've still got nodes. And now at least over some domain of your measurements, you've got, um, you've got your nonlinear information. I think that would be very helpful as well. Was there another part of that question, Lynn? I think I might've missed something. Uh, I think you've covered uh, what, what we need to for this minute, given <laughs> the time. Um, I, I would just note that uh, you can look on the COVID experience as a clear, dramatic failure of modeling. Um, there was a lot of pre-planning, which among others you participated in, I participated in, that didn't really consider asymptomatic transmission of coronavirus as a, as a major problem. We were too fixated on questions of influenza and the like. But along with this failing, um, you can also view uh, COVID as a demonstration of the incredible importance and value of the modeling capabilities where would we be if we couldn't basically analyze and model the projected rise of the, of the virus and uh, the nature of its transmission and, and the like? Those are just fundamental tools for us. And now the great issue is as we get variants, the British variant B117 and so forth, the South African and uh, Brazilian variants, what, uh, how do we comprehend their significance for us in the time ahead. And that involves very elaborate modeling processes. So I, I would just conclude by, by saying that I think what you've done for us here is to underscore the absolute imperative of uh, clarity, logic, muscularity, robustness uh, in modeling. And at the same time, I think uh, the need for kind of humble recognition of the bounds of that modeling and its limits. Um, you get the last word, Reggie, if you wanted to say something. Yeah, you know, so Rich, I, I think my last word is, I wish I'd said it as well as you did. <laughs> that, was, that was excellent. I can't say anything better than that. Just thank you. <laughs> well, on this note of amity, I think we should both yield to Lynn, who's done a terrific job of being Greek chorus. And I might add, uh, Lynn, uh, it's the original Greek chorus actually did singing and dancing as well. And I know you're capable of it. So I think I want to thank you for restraining yourself in your questions as well. It's been difficult. It's, it's been such a celebration just to listen to the two of you and to take part in this webinar. Um, and thank you both uh, to our moderator, Dr. Mm -hmm. Richard Danzig and our speaker, Dr. Reginald Brothers mm -hmm. for sharing your valuable insights and uh, rising to the challenge of some of these difficult questions. Many thanks as well to all of you for attending and for contributing your thought provoking questions. And please mark your calendars for our next event on March 18th when CSET Research Assistants Emily Weinstein and Ryan Fedashuk will be joined by Senior Fellow Anna Puglisi to discuss China's pursuit of technology in the future through legal, illegal, and extra-legal means. In the meantime, we appreciate your being with us today. Stay safe, and we hope to see you again, if only virtually, real soon. <laughs>